Uh, Senator Mark Green from uh, Clarksville, he is our state senator for District 22 in the state of Tennessee, but that would put, that would just be one of the last of his accomplishments. Uh, Mark is also, was born in southern Mississippi, he has a pastor for a dad, and uh, decided that he wanted a little financial help with his college, so where the rest of us would probably go to financial aid, he just went to West Point. So. Uh, from West Point, I think Army, I mean, uh, then Rangers, uh, became part of the, of the Army Rangers, uh, went through that program, was then decided through a, uh, a, a situation with his dad where his dad was treated uh, in an emergency room by a trauma surgeon that he wanted to ask the Army to send him back to medical school. Are you guys keeping track of all these things? I'm, it starts to blur after a while. Um, then after that, he was redeployed and was part of the uh, trauma team involved in a lot of the higher profile missions that later were seen in the movies, things like, you know, Lone Survivor and Black Hawk Down and all those kinds of things. So, um, Mark has been around. He also um, was also involved in asked when Saddam Hussein was captured, he, they needed someone to care for him and sit with him during the night of his capture. And so Mark was there for six hours with Saddam Hussein and a translator and talked to this man who was completely broken at this point or had, had, had ended up at the bottom of the barrel. And so Mark is gonna share some, some of his words with us today for about 25 minutes. And we're gonna have like about five minutes of question and answers if you guys wanna ask him some questions. And then after that, we're gonna go straight to our uh, table discussions as we always do. So uh, gentlemen, this is Senator Mark Green. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I, uh, it's a little bit of a different setting than back in 2003, 2004. I, I remember in 2004, I was uh, actually in the mountains of Afghanistan with a bunch of Navy SEALs. We were flying in a Chinook helicopter. That's the big one with the two uh, main rotors. And we're at about 12,000 feet, uh, pushing the really pushing the envelope of this helicopter in the high, thin air mountains, loaded down with Navy SEALs over Taliban territory and the engine of the aircraft decided to speak to us. Now when a helicopter engine talks to you, it's not telling you, hey buddy, you just won the lottery. It's, it's usually bad news and of course this day it was. I'm sitting there listening with the crew and it goes ding, 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 engine two, fire. Engine two, fire. Now these Night Stalker pilots, and you uh, mentioned the Black Hawk Down thing. I mean, how many of you saw that movie, Black Hawk Down, Lone Survivor? So these, I, I was assigned to the Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and I was their flight surgeon, their physician. I'm wired in with the crew listening to them, and let me tell you, they're amazing pilots. Uh, these guys could fly helicopters upside down. It's just unreal. But as this engine is on fire, they're going, you know, they're doing their drills, and I'm powering down up deploying the fire extinguisher. My blood pressure is rapidly rising. Theirs, of course, is like this. And then engine two decides to speak again. And engine two says, ding, 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 engine two out. Engine two out. And without skipping a beat, and in perfect blue-collar comedy fashion, one of the crew, one of the gunners says to the pilot, how far do you think we'll get on one engine? And the pilot immediately says, well, all the way to the crash site. And those guys thought that was funny, but uh, anyway, I survived that, and I've survived my first three years in the Tennessee State Legislature, and it's just about combat, let me tell you, um, but, but it's been a great experience, and it's, it's awesome, too, because it gets me an opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ. Honestly, it does. I, I, people wouldn't know who I am in Brentwood if I wasn't a state senator, and I get to come down and, and meet folks and tell you about what I believe about God. And uh, it's interesting, uh, some of the lessons, we, if people say, well, what did, what did you learn from Saddam Hussein while you were there? And it's interesting, a lot of it is about faith. Um, I was in the cell with the captured king of Babylon. This guy who thought that he was to be Nebuchadnezzar, the return of the leader of all the Arab peoples. He thought he would unite them 
and bring them together. And the interesting thing, the real lesson I took away from my time with Saddam was this concept of absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what happens in the human heart when it's left unchecked? I was talking to Saddam and uh, you know, I asked him lots of different questions during the interview, but uh, one of the questions I asked him was, why did you go to war with Kuwait? Why did you start Desert Storm 1? And Saddam gave me all these justifications about who owned which oil field and where the boundary line between the two countries was. And then he said something incredibly insightful into the mind of a tyrant. Saddam basically said, he held up his hand, interestingly enough, and, and cupped it like this, pointed to the center of his hand and said, uh, the cradle of human civilization comes from the Tigris and Euphrates River. Every person on this planet comes from here. Everybody is an Iraqi. And I'm the president of Iraq. So Saddam was essentially saying he was the king of the world and he could do whatever he wanted. And, and it's, it's interesting. as I, I, It's exactly what I kind of expected to see when I got there. I, I um, had gone all over Iraq looking for WMD and looking for Saddam with the special operators. In every city, there's a statue of Saddam. There's a painting of Saddam. In fact, the people of Iraq were required to keep a painting of Saddam in their home, and they only had one cloth that could be used to clean his picture, and it's a dusty place. And uh, that cloth could be used for no other reason but to clean the picture of Saddam Hussein in their home. You know, how does a guy go from being a leader of a country to a hole in the ground? How does a guy go to a place where he thinks so much of himself that he can rule the world? And of course, his ignominious end at, at the end of a rope uh, was exactly what the man deserved. He had killed hundreds of thousands of his own people, uh, started a war with Iran that cost the lives of a million plus people, used chemical weapons on his Kurdish, uh, you know, peoples, uh, killing women and children. I mean, just a horrific guy. How does the human heart get there? And um, has anybody got a Bible with them this morning? Skip does. My assistant took my phone. I wasn't thinking about it. I need it. Uh, but Romans, Romans 1 is kind of uh, the, the passage that I want to go to. And um, Toward the tail end of Romans 1, Romans is sort of the, the best book. It's Christianity 101. If you ever want to study all the precepts of the Christian faith, Romans does a great job of capturing them. But this passage in Romans, and uh, have you got it there, Skip? Thanks. Now, what version is this? It's uh, Okay. I'm going to scoot down here. Okay, I want to just share with you this passage from Romans. And it's, uh, to me, it's pretty powerful. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though that they are, have been understood and seen through the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. For they knew God but they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling the mortal images of birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity and to degrading of their bodies among themselves. Now, this is sort of step one. Step one is they know the truth, and they kind of ignored the truth. And God responds by releasing them to their lusts and their desires. If you read on in chapter one, and I'm going to ask you to do that sort of on your own, they take another step into some more serious sins that are very clearly against what God says. 
And God makes another action and releases them to their complete uh, sinful and selfish desires, and then they reject the knowledge of God. It's a three-step process away from God. As we violate our conscience, we begin this process of stepping away from God. And God responds. If, if you are walking away from Him, He sort of releases some of the control measures, some of the inputs that happen to our mind. And before long, we've lost the knowledge of who God is. That first chapter of Romans talks about basically how a man can go from understanding who God is, having knowledge, ignoring it, to having no knowledge of God. And I kind of consider it the downward spiral of man. It, it's kind of what happened to Saddam Hussein in his heart to become the guy that he became. And it's, the, the point for us is more accurately described in Corinthians 8. In Corinthians 8, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth. And there's this debate going on. And the debate is, should we eat this meat that has been used in a sacrificial service to these idols, these gods that don't matter? We know the truth. We believe in Jesus Christ. But there's these idols that other people are sacrificing animals to, and then they're selling the meat and we're buying it and eating it. And, and Paul's point was, yeah, that's not wrong, because those idols are nothing. They're not gods. But the young believers think that it's a big deal. So don't eat it. Even though you can, don't, because you know what? You're, viol you're causing them to violate their conscience, and you're starting the process... You're starting the process down that spiral away from God. In 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, guard your conscience. Because if you don't, it will result in the destruction of your faith. Those were, those were his words. Guard your conscience. Because if you don't, it's the it will lead to the destruction of your faith. It will take you down that spiral of Romans 1. It will take you down the spiral that Saddam Hussein wound up thinking he was God. That's the long way away from center, you know, end of it all. But that's the process of how you get to Saddam Hussein. Is you take one little step away from the truth. You break your conscience just a little bit. You walk away and you look at that Victoria's Secrets catalog when you know you probably shouldn't. And it's one step away from God. And it's one step closer to Saddam Hussein. So, my experience with the uh, king of Baghdad, or the uh, king of Babylon, I like to call him, um, taught me that unchecked power results in this downward spiral away from God and to a complete self, a complete selfishness to the point that we are, I mean, he actually thought he was God himself. Um, it was pretty amazing. Now, I will tell you, and interestingly, you know, to put the capstone on that, Saddam asked us while we were sitting there in that interview, he said, uh, which way is Mecca? And he prayed, and he faced Mecca, and prayed standing. Now, there are some exceptions in Islam for a person to pray without having to bow, none of which existed that day in that room. And what my friends who are uh, Muslim tell me is that that is the equivalent of saying that you're equal to God. You know, they bow before God. Uh, they, re they really are reverent toward the sovereignty of their God. This God is so in charge, the only way for me to approach him is flat on my face. Not Saddam. Despite being a Muslim, Saddam faced God as an equal. And that's the end result of when you take that first step, and then the second step, and the third step, 
without any checks and balances that can pull you back in. And so, uh, you know, sort of the things to think about are just what are the guardrails that we can put in our lives to keep us from, when we do make a mistake, you know, that can pull us back in. One of the things that I like to, one of the verses I love to quote is uh, a, a verse of uh, David's, one of the Psalms. And I believe it's Psalms 119, correct me, Skip, if I'm wrong. But I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against thee. Um, that was a verse my mom quoted to me as a child. And I, one, of, one of the challenge questions I would leave you, and this is a men's devotional, so if you don't walk out of here without a challenge question, you know, you, you, I haven't done my job, right? So are you memorizing scripture? Are you putting the word of God in your heart so that when that temptation comes that's inviting you from Satan to step away and break your conscience, violate your conscience so that it becomes easier and easier, just like quitting. You know, why don't we tell our children, don't quit? Because we don't want them to become quitters. Because once you quit, it becomes easy to quit. Well, once you violate your conscience, it becomes easier and easier in that pathway. And so, what verses have you memorized about lust of the flesh? What have you memorized about being truthful in business dealings? So that when that challenge comes, the verse pops into your head and you don't sin against God. You don't violate your conscience and you stay right where you are. In fact, uh, John 5, 24 says, he who has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he, or John 14, 21, I'm sorry, John 14, 21. He who has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. Starts with he who has my commands, that means you're in the word of God, and obeys them. He loves me, I love him, I show more of myself to him. So by obedience, instead disobedience we go away from God, but obedience, doing the right thing, we grow to God, and he comes to us. So um, just... A few words from an ex-Army Ranger turned doctor, now Senator, and uh, president of a health care company. I'll be speaking at the Franklin Rotary today on leadership and culture and organization, so if you want to come join me there, I'd, I'd love to see you. But I'm not sure if that's uh, kind of what you were looking for, Pastor, but uh, there's a little bit about Saddam Hussein and what I got out of it. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, if anybody had any questions for Mark, he's going to be here a little while longer for maybe another 10, 10 15 minutes or so. If uh, there's any questions anybody wanted to ask, this would be the time to do it. That's a great question and one I get frequently. What, what happened to the WMD? <clears throat> it's interesting. I arrived in Iraq and I... I actually could get you a copy of my book if you wanted one, but there's a picture I took of all of the Iraqi uh, airlines planes. We got in there and all these commercial airliners had been converted to cargo planes. It was thought, this is weird, all the seats taken out and cargo stuff was put in there. Two years after that, so two years after the fall of Baghdad, I've gone in and I've seen these pictures planes and I've taken actually taken pictures of them. I read George Seda's book. George Seda was the uh, air marshal for Saddam Hussein. And it's a fascinating book because George Seda was the only Christian that Saddam Hussein allowed to be around him. And Seda told about all of the special missions with special weapons that they did. And he basically said when the, there was a dam that broke about six months to eight months before the war, in Syria, and it flooded. It was basically a natural disaster. And Saddam, under the guise of flying humanitarian aid to Syria, put the special weapons on those aircraft, stripped the Iraqi aircraft, or Iraqi airlines, made them cargo aircraft, and flew the weapons to Syria. So I'm reading this book going, holy cow, I saw those things. I saw those planes. 
And to me, it was enough evidence to say that Seda's story must be true, because uh, I saw them two years before I actually heard the story of what their purpose was. I believe the weapons were moved to Syria. Yeah. No, that, that might have been somebody else. I, I never, in fact, I stayed away from those questions. You know, here I am a physician in there to make sure that he doesn't martyr himself. The last thing I wanted to do was get involved in something that would foul the investigation. So my questions were, why did you start the Iran-Iraq war? Why did you start the Kuwait war? You know, those kinds of things. Um, I really, more historical. Tell me about your first coup attempt. Um, you know, what was it like living in Egypt under Abdul Nasser? And that was sort of some of the influence, of course, that Saddam had, Abdul Nasser being sort of this pan-Arab leader uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And, and Saddam wanted to be Abdul Nasser. He wanted to be Neb Nebuchadnezzar um, from, from a historical perspective. But I asked about those kinds of things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, with Christian persecution rising and the taking away of I consider the First and Second Amendment rights of people trying to do that, what is Tennessee doing to protect those? I think um, there are a lot of. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have a constitutional carry bill this year, so um, and I know there are people who have mixed feelings about that, but I, I genuinely believe that the First Amendment. Here's what I, I mean the Second Amendment. This, here's what I believe about the Second Amendment, and then I'll talk about the First Amendment. And uh, I'm sorry, his question was, in Tennessee, in the government, what are y'all going to do to help protect the First and Second Amendments? Essentially, right? And from the Second Amendment standpoint, you know, you you look at when the Second Amendment was written. The citizenry was a part of national defense. I mean, it was, they had to be. We didn't have this huge army. They tried to put one together at the last minute, sort of, and, you know, Washington built this army, and the citizenry were critical to the defense of the country. Well, think back to what happened in June, I believe it was June, it was either June or July in Chattanooga. It was July. These ISIS lone wolves cannot be stopped by the FBI 100% of the time. They cannot be stopped by the CIA. They cannot be stopped by our U.S. military as mighty as it is. The last line of defense of our nation is an armed citizenry. And I genuinely believe it is our duty, not our right, but our duty to protect the men and women and the children of this nation by arming ourselves and training ourselves to be armed. Because unlike the middle part of this country's uh, growth and development when the army could go and fight the enemy overseas and those days are gone. We're in a whole new era and the only way to defend this nation is just like in Texas when those two ISIS shooters tried to take somebody down and an off-duty cop pulls a service revolver and caps both of them and no one's hurt. Just imagine had somebody been standing there when that lunatic stepped out with his gun and they just reached and popped him in the head with a gun and saved the lives of five great Americans. So. That's my belief about the Second Amendment. I think you'll see a lot of constitu you, you'll see a constitutional carry, if not from me, from, from someone else. The First Amendment. We're meeting today to talk about marriage and what we can do there. Um, the problem is multifaceted. From a faith standpoint, we all believe, you know, if you're Christian, that it's a man and woman. Uh, in fact, that first chapter in Romans talk is one of the strongest about homosexuality in the Bible, and it's undeniable what the Word says. Um, you can pretend it away, but it, it's, it's in there. Um, but even bigger, or, no, let me take that back, not bigger, but also important, is 1.4 million Tennesseans voted 
that marriage would be between a man and a woman. In, and in that election year, Bob Corker ran for the first time against uh, Ford. So Corker Ford, Corker got 992,000 votes. And it was slightly more, you know, than Ford got, and he beat Ford. But 1.4 million Tennesseans voted that marriage was a man and a woman, meaning a lot of Democrats crossed the line and joined the Republicans in the vote that marriage would be between a man and a woman. And five guys in robes decided to undo that, right? And so right now we're kind of calculating, well, how do we, what do we do? Uh, there are lots of efforts going on, different ideas about how to capture this, how to go after this uh, animal. Uh, I'll let you know more after we meet. I'm meeting with David Fowler today at 10, so. Um, yes, sir? You know, who knows? Maybe he thought we'd go away and then he could come back and retake, you know, power of the country. He Had he fled, he would have been turned over to us. So his only hope of survival was to try to hide in Iraq somewhere and hope that his, uh, you know, connections would work. But we continued to whittle those down over time. We were capturing what we called Saddam enablers. And, uh, you know, the... It just fell like dominoes until we got him. Um, and, and, but, but literally what he was thinking was, please don't let him pull that map off, mat off. Please don't let him pull that mat off. Please don't let him. That. Any other questions? Yes, sir. He was charming. You know, I, people often ask me the question this way, did you have a sense of evil? And the answer is absolutely no. I'm sitting there talking now. That, yeah, also, this is sort of the spoiler to it. Um, I mean, imagine you just won a Super Bowl. Wait, that happens every year. I can't, I don't know a parallel. A World Cup. I mean, you're you're an elite team of special operators, and you just captured a notorious dictator. In history, we didn't capture Hitler. We didn't capture Pol Pot. I mean, this is... So I'm standing in the room having just gone on this mission with Saddam Hussein. The elation of that moment was intoxicating for me. Now, um, but as I'm talking to the guy... I remember distinctly reminding myself, Mark, don't become enamored by this guy. He would boil your children in acid to get a fake confession. And we found the places where he and his sons actually did that. So, I mean, uh, I do remember distinctly saying, whoa, w w don't become enamored by this guy. And maybe that is the, the, the real face of evil. You know, we often talk about Lucifer or Satan being this the second most beautiful angel, right? And, and, and funny, you know, it's the guy who is super talented that often drifts away from God and thinks more of himself than he probably should. A lot of people kind of struggle with being David, you know, facing all these difficult challenges, living in a cave. Some people really are good under those circumstances, it's Solomon that becomes the real challenge. I mean, live with plenty and still cling to God. That, you know, Solomon wound up with this enormously divided heart. He filled it with wealth. He filled it with concubines and many wives. And he had this divided heart. And that's not what God wanted. God was very displeased. So, which, which are you? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I've always kind of asked myself, I, David is easy for me. Put me in ranger school, I will run to God every time. God, help me get through this. God, help me get through this. Put me in plenty, and there's a couple of weeks before I have my quiet time. Right? That's when it's tough. Now, it's hard to convince somebody who's struggling over here with bankruptcy or a cheating wife or, you know, but really, truthfully, this 
is just as hard. Uh, my personal feeling. But that, that's a great question. Yes, sir. The nexus between drugs and terror. Well, Kanduz was attacked just recently in Afghanistan, right? So the Taliban go and they recapture Kanduz uh, in, in Afghanistan. Why? Because it's the central city controlling the opiate trade. Um, there's a huge connection between the sale of narcotics and funding uh, you know terrorist operations, um, and and multi, I mean you can you can Google it and and find lots of news articles on it. Um, they get their their funds legitimately. I mean honestly, it, Iran can just negotiate a deal with a major world leader and get billions of dollars, right? So um, they they can find ways to get money. Yes, sir. Thank you. The honor's mine. Thank you. Are there other veterans in the room? L raise your hand. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Yes, sir. Fire away. My, my thoughts are this, and I look at life sometimes as a believer in Christ, sometimes as a leader in a church, but a believer of Christ, and sometimes as, you know, I'm a CEO of a healthcare company, so I, I put that hat on, but I'm still a believer in Christ. And then I, I, I'm a state senator. And I think governments have to protect their people. There's a responsibility that's, that, that ranks above certain things. But as an individual, my responsibility is to serve those who are in need, Matthew 25. You, you can't run from that. So what individuals do and what the government do, does may not always be the same thing. Now, the government could protect Americans by closing the border to prevent terrorists from coming over, right? It could close the border to uh, protect those in America who don't have jobs and, I mean, so the government can take actions that are slightly, um, in my case, if I'm aware of somebody who's in need, I I'm supposed to help them. I'm supposed to clothe them. I'm supposed to visit them in jail, it says in Matthew 25. I'm supposed to feed them. Because at, at the end of the day, I'm going to stand before God, and this is Matthew 25, the story of the sheep and the goats. And God's going to look at me, and the verse says it just like this. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in jail, you didn't vi visit. When I was sick, you didn't. And so they look up at God and say, when did we see you sick or hungry? And he says, when you didn't do it to the least of these. So as individuals as, as, and as a church... Well, you have a responsibility to give to people in need and serve people. As a government, though, I have a responsibility to protect the people of this nation, or in the case of Tennessee, the state of Tennessee. I want to help those who are in need, of course, but I have a responsibility. I work for y'all. Every one of y'all in here are, are my boss. So it, that's my, you know, sort of... I don't know if it's duplicitous. I certainly don't. I hope it's not. But in my head, that's how I've rationalized the decision-making at the various levels of, of who I am. 
And my wife and I, we run a free health care clinic in Clarksville. We're opening our second free health care clinic in Memphis on December 1. We hope to put these free health care clinics in churches all across the state of Tennessee. But that's something that I'm doing as an individual. I don't think it's the government's responsibility to do that. Because I'll tell you, the movement right now is that the government takes care of everybody in need. We don't need God. So I see our, our sort of government-based assistance taking God out of the picture. And if you look at uh, the Gospels, if you go and study the Gospels, every person who came to Christ came to Christ with a physical need. It was either hunger or uh, a disease. Now, you could, you could argue that the guys who came with demon possession and asking to have that demon cast out was a spiritual need, but really the manifestation of it for those people were the physical problems that it caused. People go to God because of a physical need and they walk away with a spiritual need met. That's the story of the Gospels. And so government has stepped in, at least in this country, and done all the work for the church. And so the person who's in need goes, they look to the government for the answer, not God. And I think in that way, government has done an injustice that's even bigger than just the entitlement, creation of an entitlement welfare state. I think it's even bigger. And in this setting, I'll share the story. I think it interrupts the opportunity for people to come to a saving knowledge of who God is. So. Maybe, maybe yes. More. Yes. There's a fund called the Nazarene Fund, and you just Google that, and you'll go right to it. It's a fund that set up 100% of what you give goes to get Syrian Christians out of the nation. There were 2 million Syrian Christians uh, five years ago. There's now less than 400,000. And uh, the first 200 are going to Hungary right now as we speak, 200 families. I, uh, I had a good friend who was a Muslim in, uh, Alep from Aleppo, Syria, and uh, he and I had a great relationship. We worked in a hospital together. Uh, and Aleppo was a fascinating city. About half of it was Christian and about half of it was Muslim. And on the Muslim celebrations and holidays, the Christians would babysit the Muslim children for the parents and vice versa. It was like the only place on the earth where the Christians and the Muslims got, you know, got along okay. And what this guy described to me, which was a little bit heartbreaking, but everybody had given up on trying to convince each other, right? They just decided, okay, we, I can't convince you. You can't convince me. Let's just live together, and you'll babysit my kids when we have our things. And it, pretty fascinating. Syria now is not that place. And, um, you know, these ISIS guys are unbelievable. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Th thanks. We want to thank Mark for his wonderful talk um, yeah, and we really appreciate his insight and he can speak on so many different levels state government military I mean we could I could listen to him for hours uh, you have discussion questions on your table and like I said you'll get through the second one then you guys go off the rails I know it's gonna happen but I have to put three or four down there and uh, we'll check back with you at 745 thank you very much <laughs>